Steve Croft, an astronomer, astrophysicist, and educator, specializes in the interplay between black holes and their environments, in time domain and radio astronomy, and in the search for intelligent life beyond Earth. Extensive experience dealing with large data sets and scientific writing. He's enthusiastic about communicating astronomy to the general public and expanding educational access and equity. Please welcome Steve Croft. I'm Steve Croft, and I'd like to tell you today about how GNU Radio can help us find ET. I'm jointly affiliated with the Berkeley SETI Research Center, which is based on the UC Berkeley campus, and with the SETI Institute uh, just across the bay in Mountain View, California. The motivation here is that in the last few decades, we've discovered that planets are common. Indeed, Earth-like planets are common uh, in the universe. There are hundreds of billions of stars in our galaxy, and about one in five of them has a potentially habitable planet around it. So to paraphrase uh, Enrico Fermi and his so-called paradox, where is everybody? If there's all this real estate out there, then why haven't we seen any signs of life? There are three main ways that we can search for life. One is direct in situ sampling. So we can go to Mars with instruments like the, those on the Curiosity rover. We can directly sample the dirt that's there and we can see if the signs of biology that's there now or has been there at some point in the past. We can also do remote sensing for so-called biosignatures. Now this is uh, really challenging. Imaging planets going around, around other stars is very challenging and getting spectroscopic information where you could see signs of oxygen or water vapor or maybe even uh, vegetation in the atmosphere is really hard. It's gonna be out of reach uh, really um, for even the next generation of telescopes like the James Webb Space Telescope. And uh, there's proposed successes to Webb, um, Louvoir or HabEx, so there'll be a selection made by NASA in 2021 for these missions to launch around 2035. And you can see uh, the mirror sizes down there in the bottom right. Um, it's really gonna take a big leap in technology in order to be able to detect biosignatures around uh, even a handful of nearby stars. So uh, we have one example here on Earth of an inhabited planet. And here on Earth, biology has also developed technology. And of course, uh, radio communications technology, the topic of this meeting, uh, as many of you are aware, is detectable at interstellar distances uh, under the, the right conditions if you have a large antenna. So um, the so-called Techno signatures as a proxy for intelligence are the basis of SETI searches, these searches for extraterrestrial intelligence. Not limited to just radio, we could look for powerful lasers, uh, we could look for evidence of large structures uh, that have been built in orbit around stars, which might modify the light of the stars as they go around. Uh, but really the traditional SETI searches are uh, in the radio and that's still sort of the bread and butter, we're still just beginning to explore uh, the uh, breadth of the radio spectrum at different frequencies to build uh, instruments that are sensitive enough to pick up um, uh, technologies that are sort of earth level, um, leakage radiation from, from technologies like we have here on earth or intentional transmissions that have been beamed in our direction. The largest SETI search underway today is the Breakthrough Listen uh, project. Uh, and I'm the project scientist for Breakthrough Listen on the Green Bank Telescope. You can see here a uh, picture of the Green Bank Telescope with the Breakthrough Listen chief engineer, Dave McMahon, in the foreground. The collecting area of GBT is the same as two football fields. It's uh, the largest movable dish uh, that is uh, anywhere on the planet. And it really is uh, amazingly sensitive. And the Breakthrough Listen project has 20% of the time on the GBT uh, to observe stars, actually to observe other galaxies, to observe a variety of targets of interest. And so we're doing a, a SETI search, the likes of which has not been done before. Uh, we're also putting instruments on other telescopes around the world, uh, optical and radio in different places. Uh, we've got a project with the Meerkat Telescope in South Africa, which is the precursor telescope for the Square Kilometer Array. And then uh, the SETI Institute also has engagements uh, with the Very Large Array in New Mexico to put new instruments on the VLA. That's the telescope that you, if you've seen the movie Contact, you'll have seen the, the, the SETI searches that were done there um, fictionally that are now becoming a reality. And these are uh, sort of setting the ground uh, for um, the next generation, the next generation very large array in the US and the square kilometer array in, in South Africa and Australia that are really going to uh, help transform the field. 
the instruments that we have, uh, including those that are already at the Green Bank Telescope, really operate on the same principle as GNU Radio. We digitize the, the raw voltages or IQ signals. We do a fast Fourier transform to form a spectrogram, and then we look for signals of interest. Uh, so, um, in fact, we actually shipped RTL SDRs to all of our interns who are working with us uh, remotely this summer, but we've also done um, in person demos with GNU Radio that really illustrate the concepts of. Uh, forming spectrograms and then actually detecting signals, classifying the signals, and then doing the kind of searches that, that we want to do. Uh, the instrument at the Green Bank Telescope is a lot more um, scaled up than those little RTL SDRs. We have 12 gigahertz of instantaneous bandwidth with GBT. You're just seeing half of the GBT instrument here in the image on the left. And uh, we get basically billions of, of radio channels at a time. The channel width can go down as fine as three hertz. Uh, so that generates a lot of data. We have eight petabytes of storage on site, uh, 400 ter teraflops of compute. And the 64 of these compute nodes, these individual servers that you see in the racks here that are digitizing each of them 750 megabytes per second. Uh, we're observing about five hours a day, 20% of the time on the GBT. And so we're generating hundreds of terabytes per day of raw voltage data. And we've been doing that since the project began at the beginning of 2016. Uh, we can't archive all of that data. So we have to reduce that to dynamic spectra um, at uh, uh, basically um, about 2% of the original data volume. Um, uh, so uh, just uh, a few hundred um, gigabytes per hour. Um, this is the output from one of those compute nodes. So you're seeing 187.5 megahertz of bandwidth from GBT over five minutes in time. Uh, the vertical stripes here that you're seeing are um, due to the polyphase filter bank that we use to generate the spectrograms. And you're seeing some signals here, but the question is, are these signals from our own technology or should we be interested in them as potential techno signatures? Well, uh, as you're all aware, there's a lot of signals that are out there. Um, that are uh, all across the radio spectrum from human generated technology. And so this is the haystack in which we have to look for the needle of uh, the techno signature that we're searching for. So how do we do that? Well, we can point the telescope somewhere else and see if it looks different. Here is the pointing that is off the original star that we were looking at. And uh, in this graphic here using the Stellarium software, you can see just an example that I've cooked up here. Uh, the telescope pointed at the star Vega uh, in the, the close to the center of the image here. And then as you'll see in the animation, basically we're looking at uh, Vega for five minutes, we move to a neighboring star for five minutes, then back to the original target, then to another neighboring star, back to the original target, and then off to another neighboring star. And you'll see that uh, if we now shift to a different star in another part of the sky, uh, close to the geosync belt here, that even though the satellites here in the sky are, uh, are stationary in position with respect to the horizon, because the star is moving uh, relative to the horizon, this on-off method enables us to see where the signals are uniquely coming from the direction of the star by comparing to the off observations, even when there's potentially satellites passing through the telescope beam. So here's some examples, again, of real data from the telescope. Uh, the on observations, where we were pointed at a particular star, are in the top row. The off observations in the bottom row. And so essentially what this amounts to is we're looking for signals that are in the top row of images where we pointed at the target uh, that are absent in the bottom row. And you can see just by eye here, uh, there are no convincing examples of signals that are just in the top row. There's certainly some that appear in the top and bottom, including, if you look in the right two panels, some signals around 2400 megahertz, 2.4 gigahertz. This is uh, probably uh, a Wi-Fi signal from somebody that hasn't turned off their, uh, their phone uh, Wi-Fi when they're at the telescope. So <clears throat> essentially what we want to be able to do is to kind of draw boxes around signals in images like this uh, to recognize and classify the signals that are in there and uh, to look for anomalous signals um, and the sort of cartoon here, the ET signals appearing in the the, uh, the upper row, and then to uh, tease those out and to, to follow them up, basically, if there are signals that are interesting in that respect. Um, if you want to have a play around with some of the data, we have about two petabytes of public data, uh, in addition to several more petabytes that are just stored on disk at the telescopes. Uh, there's some observations of the Voyager spacecraft. So even though uh, Voyager is about 20 billion kilometers from Earth, we can pick it up 
uh, both the carrier and data signals loud and clear with the Green Bank Telescope. And you can go and work through some Jupyter Notebook tutorials. Uh, you can look at the Open Data Archive and you can find uh, data there and, and have a look at it yourself. There's also some GBT data that's in SIG and F format, which you can read into GNU Radio directly. And uh, Derek Kozel has some nice tutorials. We're going to be working through this in the uh, workshop that we're doing later in the conference, uh, where we can actually find the Voyager signal using uh, the GNU Radio flowgraphs here. And, and here it is. Um, the, the big spike in the middle is the DC spike that you see in the bottom left, but you can see faintly uh, around sort of uh, 2,200 or so on, on uh, 20,000 or so on the x-axis here. That's the Voyager carrier and uh, the, the two data channels there. So as I mentioned, uh, Breakthrough Listen has about 20% of the time on the GBT. Here's a little snapshot of the GBT schedule. Um, but uh, SETI scientists also have 100% of the time on the Allen Telescope Array. And if you want to try engineering experiments, uh, this is a really good place to do it. And my colleague Alex is going to tell us more about the ATA in just a minute. Uh, we have some undergraduate internships. I mentioned uh, interns working with us during the summer. If any of you are undergrads and are interested in working with us, uh, we'll be opening applications in December, uh, closing in February for next summer. And you can also watch uh, our social media for any job announcements that are coming up. Um, so before I hand over to Alex, uh, I'd like to just point you to, again, our social media to some resources where you can work through uh, some of our data in Jupyter Notebooks. And uh, we're really excited to be partnering more closely with GNU Radio. I hope there's going to be a lot more collaboration in future, getting our data into GNU Radio using uh, the tools and techniques in GNU Radio to find signals of interest. Thanks very much. Hello, my name is Alexander Pollack. I'm the Science and Engineering Operation Manager of the Allen Telescope Array. And today I'm going to talk about the development for radio techno signature searches using GNU Radio. So, the first part of the talk, I'm going to give you an overview of the Allen Telescope Array or the ATA, how the telescope looks like, how many antennas we have, the infrastructure and the research which we're doing with that telescope. And in the second part, I'm going into detail on the community GNU radio hardware, which we installed a couple of months ago and which purpose is to kind of allow the GNU radio community to take data and use the telescope in the GNU radio environment. So to, to give you an overview, so the Allen Telescope Array is uh, located in the Lassen National Forest at the Head Creek Radio Observatory, which is about five hours north from San Francisco, depending on Bay Area traffic. And if you look at Google Maps, you can see a nice area shot of it where you can see all of those dots. Those are the 42 individual antennas which are scattered around the main site. And then we have the building which has a green roof here. That is a central signal processing building. So all of those antennas are connected via an analog fiber link into that building here where then the digital signal processing is located. On top of that, we also have a small visitor center in there where kind of people can come in and get some information about radio astronomy and the search for um, extraterrestrial intelligence. So the other buildings which you can see here um, are mainly kind of labs where we do maintenance work on the feeds and on the antennas um, and machinery. So if we look at the antennas itself, we have 42 antennas installed. And each of those antennas has um, 6.1 meter diameter. So that's the primary reflector. And then uh, for 2.4 meter secondary reflector. So the purpose of those reflectors is to have a large collecting area and then focus the waves at the focus point in the center here, where we then deploy our feed, which detects the signal and then sends it to the central signal processing room via the fiber link. The nice thing about the ATA is that it's a very flexible instrument. So you can use all of the 42 antennas together to look at one object. Um, so you get the most sensitivity, the most collecting area. But if you say you want to kind of observe more area, you can also, or multiple 
objects. You can also group them together in subarrays and then point at different objects of interest at the same time and do observation that way. So it is very flexible. You can do an observation with a single antenna and up to the 42 antennas. And as I said earlier, all of the signals which are collected by the antennas are sent via an analog fiber link into the signal processing room. So if you look at the heart of the antenna, we have the Antonio feed, which is something you not really see very often in those types of antennas. It's a log periodic design. And the idea is of the log periodic design that low frequencies are coupled in at a quarter wavelength here, the low where the antenna or the feed is bigger, and the higher frequencies are coupled in on the top where it's smaller. So pretty much the operational frequency band of those antennas just or feeds just depends on the size of that um, feed here. And in our design, um, which we deploy, it works from one gigahertz to 15 gigahertz, whereas the fiber link at the moment just supports 12 gigahertz and is in the process of being upgraded also to 15 gigahertz. So you have to imagine all of those parts, that copper part here is in vacuum. So we have what you can see over here, a glass cylinder, which holds high vacuum. And then we have a cryo cooler, which cools down that entire feed to about 80 Kelvin, which reduces noise and therefore improves the sensitivity. And as I said, kind of here, here that one is a picture where you can see the feed installed in the focus point of the antenna and where it is an operation. To give you an overview of the overall kind of instrument on a very kind of top level basic design, we have our antenna. We have the Antonio feed, which is the conversion between the radio waves traveling in free space to the radio waves traveling then on the optical fiber. And then the signal comes out in the central signal processing room. And here we have those radio frequency conversion boards where the yellow fibers, each of that pair is one antenna. So we have two polarization, um, one antenna. And then that conversion board allows you to look at four different tunings, which you have here within, with a 700 megahertz bandwidth within those um, one to 12 gigahertz. So you can select at the same time, um, for example, all of the same frequencies or kind of multiple frequencies, or we can have multiple instruments looking at the same frequency. So at the moment, there are two instruments which are deployed. One is a uh, SNAP-based FPGA board, which we use for our observations. And the second one is the other USRPs, which we installed for GNU radio, which we get into detail a bit more. Um, apart from kind of um, the overview of the whole system, we also do a lot of um, design work, modeling work. So what you can see here, for example, is an optical model of the antennas. So we have the entire ATA antenna as, as a model where we can then calculate what's below what we have for the performances. So if we install a feed or kind of um, different feeds, we can then make sure that it fits to the optics. We also have a full EM model or electromagnetic model of that feed which we use so we can optimize it and make sure that everything works up to spec. And then that is just some kind of examples of designs um, which we do in-house, especially for the ATA. Because we, we try to buy things off the shelf, but you can't do that all of the time because it's a very specialized um, instrument. So sometimes we have to, um, do our own designs. So the other thing is kind of maintenance and repair and kind of, as I said, construction and manufacturing. So that is one of those signal processing boards where we have at the moment 12 of, um, which have kind of a five gig sample ADC or single polarization or dual polarization with I think 2.25 um, gig sample sampling rate and FPGA and then a 10 gig um, ethernet link where we stream out the data. So we build a kind of all of those, so what we can buy off the shelf, and then we kind of design the enclosure and make sure that things are reliable. 
as well as kind of something which you can see here, which is an analog um, conditioning board, which allows us to set the gain level correctly for whatever digital signal processing backend comes at the end. So from there, that is our existing backend. We kind of, let's have a look. This is our new uh, um, new digital signal processing backend, which we're developing at the moment, which is called a multi-mode digital backend. So the idea is very similar. We use an RF SOC to digitize up to four antennas, um, dual polarization, um, or pretty much eight and two antennas for tunings, if you wanna take all of the tunings, and then we can stream out all of the data via 200 gig ethernet link. And the idea there is if you have generalized voltages, you can set up your digital signal processing or what you wanna do with the digit, um, generalized voltages, then at the end um, by subscribing compute nodes. So you can implement a correlation or a correlator, a baseband capture, beamforming, um, deep space um, modem. So you can implement that very flexible with such a design. And so we're in the process of designing a system which will take all of the four tunings for all of the 42 antennas and digitizes them and then sends them over 100 um, gig ethernet backbone, which is quite interesting. From there, on from the development side back to what we're actually doing at the moment so a lot of the part what we want to do is observations and science so we're spending some time doing fast radio burst observation fast radio bursts are very bright flashes in radio sky which are very interesting in the scientific community at the moment we do pulsar observations so that is an example of what you can see here that's a typical pulsar plot and the peak here, which you see the triple peak, is that pulsar which is detected with the ATA. And this is a 30 minute observation with 10 antennas with 700 megahertz bandwidth. And then finally, something which we're kind of working towards is having high resolution um, um, observations or spectral observations, which are so-called kind of the SETI observations. But before we get to that point, we want to make sure that the system works. And we've done kind of a lot of verification with known sources. And then if we understand the system very well and we know it works reliable, then we start kind of at the end of the year a SETI observation campaign. So that is so far the overview of the ATA. Now I'm kind of just wanna talk a bit about the GNU radio side. So we had last year when the world was still okay in May, a hackathon where 30 plus people came to the ATA and developed software and were using the instrument for experiments um, and for software development. So that was the point where the GNU radio ATA um, came up with, which was the first attempt to kind of use uh, the ATA within the GNU radio environment. And from that onward, we had collaborations, for example, with a company called DeepSig, which is doing signal detection and classification using deep learning. And we set up an antenna on the roof here on the main signal processing building, which is monitoring um, RFI or radio frequency interference. Because our antennas are so sensitive, we need to make sure that if a visitor comes or if there's any kind of RFI source like a walkie-talkie um, close by that we can identify such sources and get information of it so we can find them and eliminate them so they're not interfering with our observations. So that is something which we are kind of quite excited about. And so that was the first step where we installed it and then a couple of months ago we were kind of quite happy to say that we bought two USRPs, an N321 and an N320, which you can see down here, the pictures, and a server which allows us to use the ATA within the GNU radio environment. So I just give you a brief overview of the system diagram for the GNU radio backend. We have our antennas here, which have the one to 12 gigahertz fiber link into the 
central signal processing room. And here we have our four tunings. And out of those four tunings, one is one tuning is connected to a switch matrix, which you can see down here the picture. And that switch matrix pretty much allows you to select on the first one between 16 different antennas, which one you want to have routed through the USRP. And then we have a 200 megahertz bandpass filter in, so the USRPs at the moment have effectively 200 megahertz bandwidth. And then the second one has eight antennas connected to it, so you can pretty much choose between 24 antennas with two USRPs, which one you want to kind of use for observation. And the output of those is then a two times 10 gig link, which goes into a 40 gig switch. And then we have our GNU radio server, which you have the picture down here, where GNU radio companion is installed and which is used to control the ATA then. And if you collect a lot of data and if that machine is full, we also have 100 terabyte storage available where you can kind of store um, data then. So that is kind of quite exciting having um, those hardware installed, hooked up to the antennas and um, a new radio library, which allows you to use them. So for kind of pretty much my summar summary slide, um, the interface into the ATA, we have uh, either a VPN connection or an SSH gateway for people who are interested on kind of coming in from the outside world. We have the full control over the array via GNU radio and the GR88 blocks. And in case that the array is used by us and you can't have full access for it, the USRPs are hooked up anyway, and you can use it as a commensal mode where you can pretty much acquire data from the ant antennas 24 seven and get the met metadata. So you know where they're pointing and you can collect all of the data. And then, as I said earlier, you can pretty much very flexible connect to which or choose an antenna which you wanna use. So if you have a favorite antenna, which you think works best, you can always pick that one. The code has been developed by an REU student, Ellie White, and she was giving or is giving a presentation here as well about the software in particular and demonstrating it and also has a poster about um, that software. And the software can be accessed at um, GitHub, SETI at HCRO, GR, ATA. And if you want to know more about the ATA, there's on the SETI homepage, um, are the ATA memos. And the first one of the A ATA memo series is an interface document which tells you exactly where the ATA is located, what the frequency ranges are, what the IF frequency is, what the clock distribution is and everything. And then also kind of 95 more design uh, documents which you can go through. And if you're interested in using the ATA and kind of working with us on developing GNU radio with the ATA, you can get in contact either with kind of Derek Koso um, or with me and we can set you up with an account for it. And with that, I'm kind of want to say thank you and goodbye.